Hello everyone, this is Jen and I make useful English lit study videos on Shakespeare, poetry, fiction, literary devices and more to help you get top grades in the subject. So if this sounds like exactly what you need, then make sure that you hit the subscribe button below so you never miss out on any of my weekly study videos. So in today's video, we are looking at one of Friar Lawrence's soliloquies in Romeo and Juliet. Now, Friar Lawrence is the monk who acts as this go-between character for the two star-crossed lovers, whom he agrees to help marry because he believes that their marriage will end the long-standing feud between the Montague and Capulet families. At the start of Act 2, Scene 3, the friar delivers a speech as he fills up his basket with weeds and flowers, observing that just as many herbs, plants and stones in nature possess both healing and damaging qualities, so people and situations in life can be both good and bad, virtuous or vice-ridden, depending on the context and perspective from which they are viewed. Specifically, the notion of maintaining balance and moderation between polar extremes is central to the message of the friar's soliloquy. His speech is dramatically ironic and foreboding, as it arrives right after the audience has already witnessed Romeo's feverish devotion to Juliet, while pointing towards the chaos and carnage that will ensue as a result of the character's emotional excesses. Throughout the friar's speech, there are many sets of antithesis, and as some of you may know, antithesis refers to two opposite ideas placed together for contrast. Right from the beginning of the speech, there is morn versus night, morn stands for morning, smiles versus frowning, light versus darkness. Now, while these may seem like contrasting ideas, Shakespeare actually presents them as different stages in the same unified cycle of time. Morning is personified as smiling on the night, while the sun's appearance both heralds a new day and dries out the dew from the night before, which marks the way one stage transforms into the next. Morning is simply evening before the sky has become bright and light is dark simply without the sun's presence. So what appears oppositional at first is then revealed to be cyclical instead. And this pattern maps aptly onto the overarching feud between the Capulets and the Montagues, whose antipathy towards each other has been cycled from one generation to the next. The friar then proceeds to introduce more antithetical concepts, such as baleful weeds and precious juiced flowers, womb versus tomb, virtue versus vice, poison versus medicine, and finally, grave and rude will. In these pairings, oppositional ideas become paradoxical statements, forcing us to reframe our understanding of contrasts that would naturally oppose each other as instead being these ambiguities which coexist. Specifically, we see this reframing in the following lines. The earth that's nature's mother is her tomb. What is her burying grave, that is, her womb? So while the earth beneath us is the womb from which all natural life springs, it is just as much the tomb which houses the remains of all that eventually dies, man, animal, or plant. So indeed, life and death, as these words that sound and look completely different, in fact, appear much more similar when they are presented in these lexical and sonic resemblance as the rhyming couplet of tomb and womb. So these words are also likely to ring evocative towards the final act, when Romeo and Juliet die together at, out of all places, the burial grave of the Capulets, and indeed, the tomb. In the latter half of the friar's speech, there's another example of paradox when he says, virtue itself turns vice, being misapplied, and vice sometimes 
by action dignified. By the way, guys, I'd massively appreciate it if you could hit the thumbs up button below, subscribe to my channel and switch on that bell notification if you find this video helpful so far. This would really help me carry on making these useful English Lit Study videos so that you can get top grades in the subject and we can inspire more people to enjoy the study of literature. So what we would usually consider to be a virtue, such as selflessness, could easily become a vice if misapplied. For example, being too selfless could open us to being taken advantage of. Equally, what often seems like a vice, like selfishness, could be appropriate in the right context. For instance, being selfish when others demand too much of our time or energy is usually a sensible thing to do. So in a similar vein, Romeo and Juliet's love for each other may seem virtuous, but it quickly becomes harmful when extreme emotions lead to rash decisions and irrational judgment. As we will go on to see from their quickness to jump to conclusions about each other's deaths in the final act. We can also argue that while the lover's tragic death is the family's punishment for their petty and unforgiving vices, it is also, in a way, a virtue that ultimately dissolves and resolves their age old animus. So all of this also brings to mind a central irony where Friar Lawrence's motives are concerned. Having thought that Romeo and Juliet's marriage will end the Montague and the Capulet's mutual antipathy, he instead finds out that it is their violent death, not their blissful marriage, which achieves his well-intended goal of peace. So we see again the cyclical pattern of life and death being played out in the children's sacrifice as it ultimately brings about the rebirth of their family's relationship. To draw an analogy with another set of lines in the speech, the death of these young lovers is the infant rind of this small flower where the poison of misunderstanding and hostility hath residence but it is also what possesses the medicine power to heal their parents from this poison once and for all. Another interesting observation in the speech is Shakespeare's use of chiastic placement, which appears in two moments. First, what is her burying grave that is her womb? And from her womb, children of divers kind, we sucking on her natural bosom find. Now in these lines, notice the syntactic shift in the repeated phrase, her womb. What would a shift, like a movement or a shuffle in the womb, suggest? An active fetus, perhaps, that's angling to be born into the world, or more conceptually, a life force that is charged with dynamic anticipation for all that this world can offer. So indeed, by placing children of divers kind right after the second iteration of the phrase her womb, Shakespeare lexically spawns forth these children to reinforce the idea that tombs, graves, and the morbid associations of these items do not, in fact, bring about death as a point of final termination but rather that they yield a new cycle of life and growth which takes root in the womb. So this conveys a hopeful idea of death, not as an endpoint, but as a hidden prelude to a new beginning, and is perhaps part of Shakespeare's attempt at calibrating the audience's mood at this point in the play, which is likely to grow more anxious and dark as the narrative and plotline move closer towards realizing that death marked love that we already know about from the prologue at the very start of the play. And if you haven't already seen my analysis on the prologue in Romeo and Juliet, make sure to check it out here. So as the speech continues, there are more indented syntactical shifts of the chiastic variety, as we see from the following. For not so vile that on the earth doth live, but to the earth some special good doth give. Nor aught so good but strained from that fair use revolts from true birth, stumbling on abuse. Virtue itself turns vice, being misapplied, and vice sometimes by action dignified. 
So consider what the friar is saying here and how those syntactic shuffles of the earth, good and vice could be interpreted as supporting his message. Essentially, the friar's point is that everything in the world can be used and seen in positive ways, but if used excessively or inappropriately, then even its greatest benefits could turn deleterious, harmful. So this notion that qualities could easily shift in nature depending on context and application, good shifting to bad, virtue shifting to vice, etc., is symbolically expressed in these quick syntactic shifts of the key words and phrases, which in turn also prepares the audience for the broader structural shifts in mood and emotionality that lie ahead in this play. Peeking at Romeo and Juliet's climactic bliss in love and ultimately plunging to the depths of their protracted despair and of course, eventual death. And that's it for this quick analysis of Friar Lawrence's soliloquy, guys. There's definitely much more to the speech than what I have covered in this video, but I hope whatever insights I've offered have inspired you to look at the Friar soliloquy from a fresh new angle, right? Because most importantly, I'm always here to just guide you and help you come up with your own unique ideas about the purpose and significance of any literary texts that you may be studying for school. Make sure you check out my other Romeo and Juliet analysis videos if you haven't already links are all in the description box below please also make sure that you hit the thumbs up button below if you found my analysis helpful in any way so that you can encourage me to keep making these weekly study videos for you and other passionate top grade lit students all around the world please subscribe if you haven't already and switch on that bell notification if you don't want to miss out on any of my weekly study videos and i will see you in the next one bye